representing himself, he had to make the final speech himself. And Mr. Anson, impressive physical presence, stood up to start his argument to the jury as to why he should not be convicted. The court is quiet. He opens his mouth and out comes, sung quite well, the first verse of Amazing Grace. <laughs> Slowly sung, hanging on every note, the jury looking, if I can use the word, gobsmack. And we were all smiling gently and wondering what was coming next. So I'm welcomed today by a friend of mine, Brian Lett, King's Council. Brian and I, we've known each other, Brian, haven't we, for some years now. Uh, I'm going to recount the story of our first meeting. Uh, but welcome. Thank you very much for taking the time to uh, to spend half an hour with us on our on our podcast where the idea is is that we meet and speak to interesting people that have crossed my path in, in my career, but it's not about me, it's about them. So uh, welcome again, Brian. Um, do you remember 1987 when we first met Brian? It may be a hazy memory. I think you were very young then, Laurie, weren't you, in 1987? <laughs> <laughs> I don't, and we've chatted about this before. I know you were, because you tell me, I know you were a junior officer on one of the, was it a robbery case? Uh, yeah, I was on the uh, the um, crime squad at Brixton Police Station as a young man in 1987, Brian, and you were not uh, Queen's Council as it was at that time. You, you were uh, a very busy council and um, you prosecuted a case for us of uh, a number of uh, men that were from Peckham that were committing aggravated burglaries and then stealing cars and did all sorts of horrible stuff successfully prosecuted them. And I must say, Brian, it was at that time, uh, and I'm going to say this because I admired you. I've always seen you as probably the best prosecutor that I've ever met, uh, which is why we. I think we then went on to cross our paths later on just before I retired. So I'm guessing you still don't have any memory of that, Brian, because you dealt no. with so many cases. So. <laughs> Not of that. I mean, the, the thing about doing conveyor belt cases rather than doing the investigation of the crimes, is that it does become a bit like a conveyor belt. And I remember particular yeah. features. I think we're coming on to a character called Mr. Anderson. Uh, you yeah. both remember well. And there are features in certain cases which stay with you forever. But because, from the barrister's point of view, you don't do the investigation from basically square one when the crime has been committed, it, it doesn't mean so much to you. Although somewhere in my brain, I have a little door, which no doubt is marked with that case of 1987, which if I really tugged, I might open. I don't, spend, I don't suppose you would call me lending you 50 quid at that uh, case either, do you, Brian? For, Isn't uh, it strange, Laurie? I do. <laughs> <laughs> I do remember. Well, look, we, we jest about our, um, our, our uh, times then, but what I really wanted to speak to you about was something that was a bit broader, really, and, and into your personal life, uh, your history in relation to your connections with Italy through your uh, late father, uh, who was indeed a prisoner of war that got captured, I think, in 1943 in Italy. Um, and out of that came some incredible charitable work that you did and a number of books uh, that you've written as an historian. And that's really what I wanted to speak to you about today, really. The Freedom Trails, the um, the charity in uh, in Italy, and really just a bit of history, perhaps, about your dad, which I just find very interesting. And I think probably the viewers were just to add context, really, to your connection to Italy. So where do we start with your dad? Uh, Rossano in Flames is the book that gives a, a historical overview uh, of uh, all of that times with him. But can I maybe just ask you to, to give us some background? Yes. And my father was a regular soldier. He had an interesting background because he was born in a remote native village in Papua New Guinea. His mother died a few days later from the effects of childbirth. And so his father, my grandfather, was working in Papua New Guinea at the time as an engineer. My dad was shifted over to grandparents in Australia. And then at the age of 11 was put on a ship and sent back here uh, for his education, which was traditional back in those days. He was born in 1910, so we're talking about early 1920s. So he came back on his own and was shunted around various branches of the family. Uh, eventually, having done school, done a year at university in France, he joined the army, pre-Second World War regular army, and, as they used to in those days, travelled the world. 
Fortunately, in a way, when he was in India, he got very keen on climbing the Himalayas and led two regimental expeditions up into the Himalayas. So he knew his mountains very well. That's relevant because he was, in fact, captured with thousands of others when Tobruk fell um, in 1942. He was shipped over to Italy, as they all were, because the Italians were nominally in charge of the North African campaign. And then he was put into one of the increasingly numerous camps for prisoners of war when he got to Italy. You won't perhaps remember this, because few people in this country do, but on the 8th of September, just gone, we had the 80th anniversary of what was the turning point for so many of the prisoners in British and Allied prisoners in Italy, because the Italians signed an armistice on the 3rd of, of September, which was then published to the world on the 8th of September, and a lot of the camps, the prison camps in Italy, then opened their gates. My dad got out with a couple of others from his camp, walked for about 10 days, a little bit more over the mountains, and ended up in a high valley called the Rosano Valley, where basically, first of all, he sought shelter, and then eventually he was asked to set up and run a partisan band, the Italian resistance, which he did. He was out there for 18 months before he was called back through the lines. He was reinforced by the SAS, who dropped into the mountain valley where he was. And basically, he had what I suppose a lot of people would call a very good war, because although he lost a lot of his friends, inevitably, he was fighting successfully a guerrilla war until the end of the war. There was a lot of planning at the end of World War II to basically patch up the countries which had just been beaten and enable them to proceed. He was involved in that because obviously he was by then well up in intelligence and what was actually going on in Italy. He served in Italy until 1950. I was born just before he left. So there we are. That's how it all started. Um, it's an incredible story, Brian. And I know you mentioned that um, your dad left you a legacy of all of this information when he passed on. And I was just curious because... You know, there will be many people, perhaps, whose parents pass away that have little information about their parents um, and what they've done. Uh, you seem to be quite fortunate because you've then obviously turned that um, legacy into some very interesting books that you've written. I think uh, eight books, is it now, that you've written in total? It's about. Oh, yeah. Um, so what form did that take then and how much research did you have to do before uh, you could then sort of put pen to paper about that whole aspect of your dad's life? Two things, really. Um, in answer to your question, I was looking towards the end of my barrister's career for something which I'd enjoy going on doing when I'd become too old a horse to do anything <laughs> other than remain chewing the cud in the manger. So... I was looking for something like writing history books because it's always a subject which has interested me. What in fact happened and triggered it all was I'd started going back very regularly in the mid 90s. I'd been there as a baby, didn't remember a thing about it. My father fell ill quite early in modern terms. He had a very bad stroke when he was 62, as many of his colleagues did who'd been up in the mountains living off starvation diets and so on. A lot of them did not survive very long after the war. Anyway, my dad fell ill and wasn't in a position to take me back to meet all the people who he knew. So I didn't go for years and years. And then I went back in 95 because there was a ceremony to book up, put up a, a monument to my father. And I went back representing the family and got to know a lot of the people there, all of the old partisans were still going because many of them have only been 16, 17, 18 at the end of World War II. And so 50 years later, all right, they were a bit elderly, says he, looking in his 70s now, 
But they were still very much compassmentists, and I made a lot of good friends, a lot of my father's friends. And one of them came from a little village called Valeriano. And during the Partisan War, the SAS arrived to reinforce my father and his activities in late 1944. And the commander of the squadron of SAS who arrived was a chap called Bob Walker Brown, lovely man, actually, and I got to know him quite well later on. But he died in 2001 or 2002, I think. And when he died, the Daily Telegraph published a an obituary of him, which libeled one of my father's partisans. Of course, he was dead and had been dead for a long time. Uh, so was Bob Walker Brown by then, of course, it was his obituary. But the libel was actually rather nasty. It, it wasn't intentional, of course, but it alleged that one of my father's partisans had betrayed the SAS stick, the little group of six men who he was guiding, and that as a result, they'd all been captured and that they, the SAS, had shot the traitorous partisan. Quite untrue. He got the story. I know the chap who wrote the obituary, but he got the story all wrong. And in fact, this particular partisan had been captured with the SAS. And because he was an Italian and it was the fascisti who had caught him, he was executed by the fascists on the spot. Uh, and the others were put into prison and were quite fortunate because they weren't executed, which a lot of the SAS caught in Italy were. But I knew the family quite well of my father's young partisan who had been shot. And so I thought I'd better do something about it. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so I wrote down the truth of what had happened with lots of references to documents I already had from the National Archives sent it to the Telegraph. They didn't publish it, except on their website. And I don't know how many people read the Telegraph website in those days. Anyway, that made me think, look, somebody needs to write an accurate account of the campaign, in particular the campaign of the SAS on that particular operation. That got me going. My answers are rather long, so if you want to be the no. judge, sorry, and cut well, me through, Brian, please. you know, it, it, very complicated, complex times that that probably deserve a long answer. To be honest, um, you know, so we know there was what over four hundred escapers that were captured from Italy, and the routes that they then took out um, from that particular region was it northern Tuscany. Um, uh, you then went on to sort of uh, assist the Monte San Martino Trust with uh, celebrating the, the routes and, and walking each year, um, uh, celebrating those escapes. I think perhaps, you know, um, we'd like to hear a little bit more about that as well. Well, yes, I was the chairman of the Monte San Martino Trust for eight years, from 97 until 2005. And during that period, we were trying to raise the profile of the trust because not 400, 25,000 prisoners oh, wow. escaped at the time of the armistice. All were let out, but they then had to make their own way. And uh, I mean, it was very difficult because they, most of them spoke not a word of Italian. They had no Italian money. They were in uniform, British uniforms, and so on. But there is a trust called the Monte San Martino Trust, which was set up sometime after the war, to commemorate all the help given by the ordinary Italians. They became involved with a man called Roger Stanton. God bless him, he's still doing very well up in Yorkshire. And he runs something called the Escape Lines Memorial Society. And they organized, uh, together with the Monte San Martino Trust, a freedom trail, as they all became known, in 2001, to trace the steps of the escapers down from north of what was called the Gustav Line, the line which ran through Monte Cassino, which was the first major defensive line of the um, Allies. They organized a four-day event, walking down over the mountains, taking obviously the most remote paths, which the escaped prisoners did, and then crossing the front line. 
And a couple of years later, because we were not able to continue in Sulmona, which was the base of the early trails, I started one from Rosano and did that, I suppose, for about 13 years. Every year we would try and, well, we would start off from a rather nice hotel at the bottom of the mountain. We'd walk up into the mountains and then we'd walk on for what was actually a very spectacular escape route because it went usually through the marble mountains above Carrara, which are staggeringly beautiful. So uh, I did a number of those. We had two routes from Rosano. One was to go down through the marble mountains to Serovetsa, crossing the second of the German defensive lines when they fell back from the Gustav line, the one that went through Monte Cassino, they fell back onto something called the Gothic line, which was considerably further north, and again, ran most of the way through the mountains. And we went down that way, and there was another sort of tourist route when I had walkers who weren't hideously fit. We'd go across to the sea. And I had the pleasure one year of doing that with Edward Certain, who came from the BBC to make a programme, which I should say is still available on BBC <laughs> iPlayer. Freedom Trails. Well, well I'm going to plug some of your stuff, Brian, because I think it's only right. And I think a lot of people would be very interested to read some of your books. Uh, and, and look, let's mention your books, actually, whilst we're doing it, because I want to talk to you about another aspect, actually. Uh, um, so, look, just some of the titles. It's Italy's it's Outstanding Courage, Hitler's Hangman, The Secret German Plot to Kill Churchill, uh, SOE's Mastermind, Extraordinary Italian Imprisonment, the small-scale raid, uh, raiding force in Fleming, uh, SOE's Operation Postmaster, and perhaps we'll touch on that in a second, SAS in Tuscany, and, of course, uh, Gordon Lett, um, Rosano Valley in Flames. Um, before I come back to that in Fleming one, um, I was curious to see a quote on your website, and it said, about my mother's war work, I was never allowed to know very much. She spent the war in heavily blitz central London, driving secret dispatches and secret people from place to place. I suspect you know a little bit more, Brian, uh, but what are you at liberty to say about your mum that uh, clearly was supporting your dad whilst he was off on his travels and incarceration? My mother was one of those who kept her secrets, as was my father. I mean, uh, he joined MI6 eventually when he came back to this country after the war. I never knew he was an MI6. I never knew where he went. And I don't know half of what he did when he got back, even now. My mother, I know, drove uh, officers on secret assignments from London to wherever they were meant to be going. And very often on the top of her car, because she was a driver, she was in the ladies' transport corps at the ATS, I forget. But she was a, a driver, because she could drive, uh, in the ladies' Um, core of drivers. Anyway, she'd drive these officers to whatever their very secret assignations were. And she would also carry dispatches. And the one thing she did tell me was that they always used to carry the secret dispatches in laundry boxes on top of the car. <laughs> so that anybody having a look at this lady, not in uniform, obviously, driving a car with some laundry boxes on the top, didn't think any anything of it so i know that little trick but i don't think that's too relevant to any enemies well, should, of this country well i now. should look for cars with laundry boxes on the top but i'm next up in london then brian so who knows well the, the laundry is a dying breed <laughs> there aren't many laundry boxes around now true no, but you know the old uh, wicker boxes they used to have yeah probably yeah. before you were born but i remember oh, why well, well um, anyways but there we are that answers that so i Maybe I should just wrap up this, your relationship with um, Italy uh, and your your dad's relationship with Italy by, you won't mind me saying that you, in 2007, I think it was, you were awarded a very important honour, actually. And, and I hope you don't mind me asking you just to tell us a little bit about that, because I'm sure you're very proud of that and it's well deserved for the work that you did there. Thank you. I am and was made in 2007 in, in December a commendatory of the Italian Republic, which is an order of merit, the equivalent of, they say, a CBE being a commander of the British Empire. 
And it was simply because of the work that I've done and very much enjoyed doing over the years uh, to commemorate the bravery of many of the Italian partisans who are so often forgotten in history, and also with the civilians who really took the most appalling risks to help our escapers, of whom there were many thousands. They didn't know them. It didn't matter what their religion was. It didn't matter what their nationality was. But amongst, in particular, the peasants in the mountains, the contadini, as they were called, there was this extraordinary ethic that if a, another human being came to your door in need, you should look after that person, even though it was at a risk in each and every case of death, perhaps not death by execution, but death by being sent to one of the ghastly prison camps, concentration camps, such as Matthausen, where they were literally worked to death and where life became a complete lottery. They risked all of that to help these escape prisoners of war. And sometimes a prisoner of war would realize that if he was recaptured by the Germans or fascists, it was very straightforward. He'd be taken back to another prisoner of war camp and see out the war there. If his helpers were caught, they would probably be shot on the spot. Their house would be burned so their family would be homeless and so on. And yet, an extraordinary number, something in the region of 80,000, were acknowledged to have helped the Italians. Forgive me. Italians were acknowledged to have helped the escape prisoners of war. And there we are. That's one of the things I was involved in and still am. Now, Brian, I have to ask you this in my own style. I remember when I was flying, I had a pilot's license 22 years, and with the police, we'd go over to France every year. We were hosted by the police de l'air, and there would be uh, two or three days of flying competition, and then the police would go off for their annual general meeting, and they'd ship us off to a tourist place, and, and then we'd have lots of wine and food and end a very pleasant week and fly back. Um I always remember the uh, the Italians often turned up, but they were the only people that turned up without any aircraft or helicopters or anything. But they had the most pristine flying suits with all of the gear, and they were immaculate, but sat in the back of our aircraft whilst we flew them everywhere. Um, I have to ask, did you did they give you a nice sort of all regalia and and not some really nice robes, Brian, when you were awarded this uh, this honor in two thousand and seven? There must have been something very Italian and chic that you were given. They don't do, the well, they do do robes, but not in the way that, for instance, <laughs> we do. No, I got my medal and I got a nice sash and a sort of little roundel which I can hang from my neck if I wish to. But <laughs> to rebut what you have just said about my Italian friends, what they do is to uh, present you with, of course, the medal but also a little lapel button, which is tiny. But you put that in your, lapel on, in your lapel on ordinary occasions when you're just meeting for lunch with whoever it may be. And the Italians are trained to recognize exactly what your rank is. And if you've got a little lapel button, then their eyes go straight to that. And it's an Italian habit. I think the French do it sometimes as well. But rather a good one because it's totally unostentatious. It just sort of sits there in your lapel. The vast majority of people you pass in the street don't know what on earth it means, but they do. So it's not all sort of pomp and <laughs> uniform. Mind you, you could smarten up a bit, Mr. Day, I think. Uh, well, look, this is all about the I, Brian, I wore, as you know, I wore a suit and tie for nearly 30 years, and um, the world's changed, isn't it? You know, you well, I wore a wig place. for 47 years it doesn't mean i wear one now well that's true but um have a look. this is one of my finest marks and spencer jackets here what's going on listen let me let me talk to you finally just to uh to actually to completely wrap this up because uh, in fleming um i read in the times yet another article this morning actually about in fleming and the whole james bond thing um you've written a book in fleming soe's operation postmaster 2012, so a little time ago now. Um, he's very much flavour of the month because there's a new film coming out. But I think you probably got My in there first, film. Brian. Yeah, but you got in there first, I think. So 
um, just tell us a little bit about that book because this may be a book that interests people and they may want to read. And I'll, we'll put a um, put your website up at the end of it. So if anybody's interested in, in acquiring your literature, we shall direct them to it for you. But just give us a little bit of history about that uh, book, Brian. Well, uh, I came across it, funnily enough, I came across a story by accident, as so often happens when you're doing historical research, uh, which is not so different from gathering the evidence together to pursue some criminal or other. But uh, having written the first book, which I mentioned earlier, was really to rebut a misleading obituary. Uh, in that uh, research, I came across a chap called Dudgeon, who, Patrick Dudgeon, who was in fact executed in Italy by the Germans, having been caught there in 1943. And I followed him back to discover what his backstory was and came across, first of all, something called the small-scale raiding force. And then their predecessors were made honor force. Made honor force were very early commandos in the most dashing and old-fashioned way. And their exploits are certainly worthy of James Bond. When I was researching them, I found that Ian Fleming popped into the story. Peter Fleming, his elder brother, had been with SOE for a time. SOE were the ones who organized Made Honor Force. And having spotted Ian Fleming, I then found myself looking through documents and orders which were signed M. Then I realized that M, in fact, was an old friend of my father's, and I had known him. I can't possibly say he was a friend. He wasn't. He was a very senior man, and I was the 18-year-old knocking around um, on the other side of the room, so to speak. But uh, that got me very interested in the, the whole concept of where the story of James Bond came from. And my own, my own theory is that Ian Fleming took the story from the exploits of Maid Honor Force because there are all sorts of clues. The interesting thing is that if you read the Ian Fleming Bond books, you will pick up on all sorts of strange references. Goldfinger, you may remember, in the book, used to smuggle his deconstituted gold around the world in a Brixham trawler totally unsuited to many waters. Why on earth did Ian Fleming choose a Brixham trawler? You then go to the Maid Honor Force story and the ship that they used to sail down from England to West Africa was a Brixham trawler called the Maid Honor, after which the, the unit was named as the Maid Honor Force. And there are many little clues like that throughout the books. And Ian Fleming was a part of it. He was the intelligence officer, because if you're a, a commando force, as you will understand, and you're based in the UK, you've got to find transport to wherever you want to attack. And they wanted to carry out an attack in West Africa. And so they had to get the permission of the Admiralty, who ruled the waves, to take a ship all the way down there. You couldn't just up anchor and leave the English coast in those days. This is 1940, 1941. You couldn't, sorry, 41, 42, you couldn't do that without the permission of the Navy. And who was the liaison officer between the head of naval intelligence and SOE, Special Operations Executive? It was Ian Fleming. And so Ian Fleming became involved with a little of the planning for Operation Postmaster, which is what Made Honor Force did. But more importantly, he was one of those who was charged with writing the totally untrue cover story to explain why when they'd pinched two ships, one Italian, one German, from under the noses of the Spanish who were neutral, so you weren't allowed to do that sort of thing, how they came to be in British custody in um, West Africa, in uh, Nigeria, Lagos, not very long after. And so he wrote this just about passable pack of lies, which was then parroted by the necessary politicians to all and sundry on the international stage. 
And I could go on, but I don't know how much time. Well, we I, I, I think you should uh, leave some of the secrets for the book for somebody to go and buy the book and read them, Brian, actually, myself. Um, because, as I say, it's very topical at the moment for, I guess, probably because of the film that's coming out and uh, people are jumping on the bandwagon. But as I say, you were there in 2012 joining the dots and uh, making the connection. So we've spoken about your, well, your family history, your writing. But, of course, there's been, as you say, what, 47 years of of an interesting times at the bar. Uh, I think by now right. a little bit more, but about 47 years, yep. Um, you were made Queen's Council, and then obviously King's Council as it is now. Uh, you remain as King's Council. And you sat, of course, as a part-time judge for, I think, over 20 years as well? 25 years. Yeah, so in itself, there must be a book there, Brian, I suspect, coming out. Nothing coming out on the book front around your... While I was still working at the bar, I started a couple of books, but I've never actually got beyond about Chapter 4 or 5, uh, perhaps one day. Yeah. I tell me, um, without any politics, how's the bar changed in forty seven years when oh, you first pitched up as a newly qualified barrister um to now? What 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 are the significant changes in in the bar as you see it? I think that's really two questions, because the bar is divided between those who specialise in advocacy and those who specialise in, I shall call it paper rather dismissively, but the more lucrative aspects, commercial law, international law, all that sort of thing. But if you are a pure advocate, uh, of course it's changed a lot. The bar is much more numerous than it used to be. There are far more part-timers than they used to be. I mean, in the sense that it was never possible if you were building a career to take time off, for instance, for maternity or paternity leave, you kept working because that's the way you built your reputation. And uh, I remember my second boy was born in the middle of a trial. I had one day off. Uh, <laughs> my junior was left to announce that actually I couldn't be there that day <laughs> because I my wife was having a baby. And I was allowed the one day off, but I was back at work immediately the next day. <laughs> uh, and there's that aspect of it. I, I don't think good advocacy has changed. The advocate's art, obviously, is to project what he or she wants to promote as an idea, as an argument. But also interacting with witnesses, although the way it is done is very often completely different from what happened back in the early 1970s, well, before the Police and Criminal Evidence Act of 1984. It was all rather different, more like a boxing match if flying squad officers were involved. <laughs> uh, you land a blow and they punch you back. That was always the, the style yeah. of it. But uh, I think a good advocate will succeed just as well today as they did all those years ago. And being able to work out what's in the witness's mind or why the witness might be giving a particular story is very important. Because you've got to understand the opposition. Yeah. 47 years, you would have, and I know that you've done so many various trials, representing both the prosecution and the defence, of course. And we go back to this famous old thing that we everybody's entitled to a defence, and we've had many discussions about that. Um, I think we should probably talk about on the lighter side. Um, you prosecuted, I think, the last three money laundering cases of mine before I left the police in 2010. But I think we should just mention briefly, probably one of the most. Um, I don't. How would we describe it? Really, was it funny? Was it just? strange was it bizarre how would you describe the case of regina versus errol anderson i think we can say his name because he's been convicted now yeah, the conviction is a matter of record mm. and an awful lot of what happened of course happened in open court so it was there for the <laughs> public to see the most extraordinary case and and old soldiers of any kind, whether it's old policemen or old lawyers, 
enjoy telling war stories over dinner or whatever. And yeah. funnily enough, only yesterday evening, to try and cheer up a, a friend of ours here in Gloucestershire, I was telling the story of the witnesses that this gentleman, Mr. Anderson, called in his own defence. You yeah. will remember, but for those who weren't there, that Mr. Anderson worked his way through a number of defence lawyers and ended up defending himself so that when he opened his case of defence, he gave evidence himself and then called the most extraordinary selection of witnesses. Perhaps I should just add some context to this, Brian. So um, I invested in a, a drug trafficking case on a, from a money laundering perspective. Um, Mr Anderson was alleged at that time to be one of the biggest cannabis suppliers and was running a cafe in Brixton. And, and just leaving the whole legalisation of cannabis and drugs argument aside, uh, the, ca the cafe was a scene for a lot more other, uh, more serious uh, crime and, and visitors there as well. A and, you know, I, I still remember from the court the stories of, um, you know, there were people in the drug rehabilitation unit in the hospital that were coming down to buy drugs and then going back to the drug rehabilitation ward. And, and, the, and the whole trial uh, brought up a whole load of other issues, uh, not least, you know, recognition of the fact that, you know, People, women were being mugged on their way home from from work after leaving the tube station by people that just wanted to undercut the market and so forth. So, cutting a long story short, Mr. Anderson was arrested uh, in possession of multi kilos of cannabis, um, and I did the financial investigation on him, his wife, and another individual that we'll leave aside for now. Uh, and Mr. Anderson ends up at the Inner London Crown Court in London. Uh, you're prosecuting, I'm the officer in the case behind you, when we see a trail of 30-odd witnesses that he calls on his behalf. Um, and as you say, Mr. Anderson decides uh, to sack a number of barristers and run his own defence, uh, Brian, of course, doesn't he? Um, and, and I should just um, say that there was no... You know, normally a case is built on some heinous allegations. And, and I think at one stage, you know, Mr. Anderson was suggesting that a number of kilos of drugs were planted on him and stuff was taken and all the rest of it. And I always remember um, he called me Officer Gay uh, for some reason, not Officer Day. And I always remember, and you, by all means, carry on this story after this little anecdote. But I remember coming in and I think I was in the witness box for, I don't know, five or seven days. And he's cross-examining me. And he, I always remember, he says, Officer Gay, he says, you're looking very smart today. He says, for a thief. <laughs> and, I, and um, you know, what, what do you say to that? But, Brian, to, to recount some of the anecdotes about Mr. Anderson and his defense. I mean, it was, it was a crazy time. The trial went on for three months. There was attempted to uh, nobble the jury. Like every conceivable thing that could happen was happening in that case. Over to you, counsel. Well, I remember three things in particular about the case, apart from the fact that Anderson himself was a, an unforgettable character, a large man, mm. and um, totally unpredictable. But three things really I remember. First of all, he was probably the most unlucky drug dealer in London at that particular time, because I was living, or my country home in those days was down in Pilton, which many of you <laughs> know, is the village alongside the Bastonbury Festival site. And I had a, a boundary of my little paddock behind the house with the boundary of the festival. So, of course, I, as all villagers were, was in regular contact with Mike Levis. We got free tickets for the festival every year, and down we went. I've got four kids, as you know. So we went down to the festival and had a lot of fun. Got home at the end of the day, and you've experienced this, Laurie. Got home at the end of the day to a nice, comfortable bed and um, a decent bottle of wine. But the result was that I was probably the only prosecuting counsel in London, if not the only prosecuting counsel in England, who knew very well indeed the ins and outs of the Glastonbury Festival site. And Mr. Anderson's defense in part was, well, I've got all this money because I used to go and sell patties, West Indian patties, at the Glastonbury Festival every summer. And that's why I have a lot of cash, because cash is the sort of currency there or was then. Anyway, I had great fun 
cross-examining Mr. Anderson about the layout of the Glastonbury site, which I think many people know centers on the pyramid stage, Mm -hmm. the main stage where all the bigger stars play. Anderson obviously had never been to Glastonbury in his life. (laughs) <laughs> and I could cross-examine him, quite literally, uphill and down Dale about the layout of the site. He hadn't got a clue. But that was sheer bad luck. Somebody somewhere had appointed me to prosecute him. That was the first point. Two other points, I think, uh, both of which you will remember. When he called his 30 witnesses for his defence, without any warning to anybody, Uh, I was very grateful to you and your team who, when a witness went into the box, would start beavering away on trying to find out more about them. But I remember Anderson called a grocer. I think it might have been a grocer he went to see at the market somewhere, but it was a grocer who came along to say, oh, yes, Mr. Anderson's a very successful uh, cafe owner, and I supply him with the vegetables and bits and pieces he needs to make his patties, his West Indian patties. And I looked at all these receipts that he got, or invoices from his point of view, (laughs) for the stuff he'd supplied to Anderson. And week after week after week after week after week, there were hundreds of packets of Rizzler papers (laughs) he supplied to Mr. Anderson. And we all know that if you're going to smoke a reefer, you need a cigarette paper. Anyway, that was one of the amusing bits I remember. The other, of course, was his final speech. Representing himself, he had to make the final speech himself. Mm. And you could tell the story, Laurie, but you've asked me to, so I will. Please All the other speeches, my speech had finished. And Mr. Anderson, impressive physical presence, stood up to start his argument to the jury as to why he should not be convicted. The judge was a man called Nicholas Philpot, who's still well in good health. I saw him not so long ago, but who was a very good judge in my view and was able to deal with anything. Up stands Mr. Anderson. The court is quiet. We wait. He opens his mouth. And out comes, sung quite well, the first verse of Amazing Grace. (laughs) Slowly sung, hanging on every note, the jury looking, if I can use the word, gobsmack. And we were all smiling gently and wondering what was coming next. Nicholas Philpott, the judge, waited until he'd finished how many lines the first verse is. And very gently, he said to Mr. Anderson, thank you, Mr. Anderson, would you like to move on to your next point? (laughs) Which I thought was lovely. That's what you'd say to a lawyer. And he treated Anderson absolutely as if he was just another lawyer. But sorry, there we are. Tales he was particular case. He was a larger than life, actually quite a likable fella, Eroy Anderson, big West Indian fella, and um, notwithstanding a convicted criminal for drug trafficking and money laundering. But um, do you remember when he, he accused um, Mr. Philpot of running a kangaroo court, Brian, as well? <laughs> and didn't he put a, a box on his head at one stage and, and do something else, start singing or something? I remember. I, I always remember when. Um, we had this trail of witnesses that you say that we didn't know who was coming next. And there were some strange people. And he brought a neighbor from a shop and a bloke came in. And as usual, you know, we got the name and address and I went off and I did some checks on the individual so I could come back and give you any information that I could to their detriment. And um, this man came in as a character witness for Anderson. Um, and when I came back, I was able to pass you the information that he He'd been convicted of importation of cannabis and had served like five years in prison himself, uh, the witness. And it just, you know, that case just went on and on and on. And it was, I think, uh, to this day, probably the most interesting, extraordinary and entertaining case. And I'm, I think somewhere I've even probably still got the transcripts of because we had a junior barrister writing everything down in the background, didn't we? So we did. Um, that in it, you know, I just that in itself would be a book. Actually, that trial, Brian, a short book, perhaps. Maybe that's a joint a joint effort for the future. Um, l- let me let me conclude this by saying, um, what is Brian let up to now? Um, I know you you still are practicing Brian as King's Counsel, but knowing you, you're ferreting around doing some research and all sorts of other stuff. I suspect there's probably another book. <laughs> 
uh, on the typewriter. Is it? Do you have a typewriter it's still, Brian, or a <laughs> computer? I had one. I haven't got any longer, although it wasn't one that I'd use. It was one I inherited in a property I owned in, in Italy. No, I'm working on. I'm working on a book which actually I've been working on rather slowly since lockdown, which all of a sudden has become very topical because it's about what we did in this country with refugees in 1940, um, which is not a happy story and does us absolutely no credit because we had allowed many refugees, a lot of them Jewish, but not only Jewish, there were political refugees from Germany, Austria, and from Italy, who came over here, were checked and allowed to come in and stay, some of them very well qualified. And when all of a sudden Hitler launched his Blitzkrieg, we lost basically the battle temporarily in Europe, and Dunkirk occurred, there was a panic stirred up by the press and succumbed to by the government, which led eventually to a fear that every single foreigner in this country might be a fifth columnist working for the Germans or the Italians, and if we were invaded, that these people might try and undermine us and commit acts of sabotage, all that sort of thing. And in a extraordinarily ill-executed operation, we arrested thousands of refugees, and also when Mussolini entered the war, uh, thousands of Italians who all of a sudden became enemy aliens, even though they'd lived here for 20 or 30 years or more, even though their sons who'd been born here were now serving in the British forces, they were to be arrested because they were enemy aliens. And the selection went wrong and we arrested diplomats, we arrested British citizens, all that sort of thing. And then the idea was to deport them from this country to far-flung corners of the British Empire as quickly as possible. And we did that, putting them on boats in the most appalling conditions, and not surprisingly, an unescorted uh, liner called the Arundora Star was torpedoed off Malin Head, Northern Ireland, and sank with the loss of more than 700 lives. Of who? Uh, what, which government were in uh, place at this stage, Brian? It was Winston Churchill's coalition government. And he is said to have uttered the words in relation to enemy aliens, collar the lot. And he was certainly then very enthusiastic about deporting them. The idea was, well, you deport all these people to Canada or even Australia. And then when they're there, you can sort out whether they're the good guys or the bad guys, but they certainly can't do us any damage. But it resulted in enormous loss of life. And there were 646, I think I'm right in saying, Italians who were marched as prisoners on board the Arundora Star, the ship that was sunk. Of those, two out of every three died. Well. And then the survivors were rescued from the Arundora Star. They were brought back to England. They were, if they weren't in hospital, placed in custody. This all happened in July of 1940. The ship was sunk on the 2nd of July. They arrived back at Greenock on the 3rd of July. And those who were not in hospital were deported again within seven days. Heaven knows about PTSD and all the conditions that we recognize now. They were in the water for eight hours before they were wow. rescued. Those wow. who survived, the dead bodies floating around them, many of them killed by the oil once they were in the water, which came from the sunken vessel. But within seven days, we deported on that particular ship just under 2,500 aliens to Australia. And not surprisingly, two days out from Liverpool, they were torpedoed. But wow. thankfully, this time the torpedo didn't explode and the ship survived. It took them 56 days to get down to Australia and they were living in truly appalling conditions. Regularly beaten by the guards who were pioneer corps, but in effect the dregs of 
the barrel. Because if we were shipping all of these aliens out, they needed to be guarded, but we did not want to use any quality troops who would help in the defence of Britain to guard them. Anyway, you can tell well, it's that, something that I'm not very happy about, book. but it's, when I hear about refugees being deported to Rwanda mm. on the conditions in which they're being kept now, mm. and the confusion and the mistakes, I mean, the percentage of those whose refugee applications succeed, the applications for asylum, is extraordinarily high. Mm. Anyway. That's what I'm working on. And if you read October's Barrister magazine, you'll see an article in it which I have written recently and they've published. Well, I'm not sure I get it delivered anymore, Brian, actually, but um, maybe I should renew my subscription. Eh? Um, what can I say? Um, Brian Lett, QC, thank you very much. It's been, well, we've certainly exceeded the uh, the, the allocated time, uh, but thank you very much for your time. Um, it's been great. It's been really interesting actually speaking to you. I don't get the chance to have a chat, Brian, so much anymore. So no, we don't. Um, yeah, but but no, it's been great. Um, thank you. <laughs>